Okay, good afternoon everyone. Welcome to the ITS Friday seminar. Uh, today we have, uh, uh, compared with last school, we have a change of flavor in terms of topics covered. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Neil Maslich. Uh, he's an epidemiologist with uh, 30 years of research experience and he worked in uh, various organizations, academia, government, unions, and a, a non-profit. And he's the uh, visiting uh, research professor in here at Davis. And also he works um, for the Public Health Institute in uh, Oakland. Um, so he'll talk about the co-benefits of active transportation as uh, uh, mitigation strategy for climate change. Yeah. Welcome, uh, Dr. Neil Thank you. Little known fact, I actually started my career in 1984 right here at UC Davis. Uh, they were just starting out a public health program, and um, which has now grown into be a pretty big program in conjunction with the medical school as well. So it's always nice to sort of like come home because this is where I started my, my career. So I'm glad you're all here. Um, and what uh, I'm gonna talk about today is um, the health co-benefits of active transportation as a strategy for greenhouse gas mitigation. So I think we're all aware of the challenges that we face on the, on the climate front, you know, both north and south, California have been recently devastated by fires. Uh, from a public health standpoint, we know that climate change is the number one existential threat in the 21st century for public health. We saw this just a few years ago in the Paradise Fire, where it was very obvious where 85 people lost their lives. I know we have Sarah, who worked on our project, who's doing follow-up to, to the issues around transportation and evacuation. There's a whole spectrum of activities that climate change change in, intervenes on when it comes to the transportation system. California is, is among the top 20 carbon emitters in the world, somewhere in that top 20s. It's been as high as 14, maybe as low as 20, but the point is that the, the roughly 425 million metric tons of carbon that go out every year, 40% of that, roughly 175 million metric tons are from the transportation sector. It is the leading source of carbon emissions in California. So what we do, related to the transportation system has a big impact, not just on carbon mitigation, but as you'll see on public health as, as well. So from the standpoint of mitigating carbon, increasing the efficiency of fuels and vehicles, that's one of the strategies that is being pursued. Uh, also just reducing vehicle miles, it could be carpooling, it could be active transportation, it could be a number of different strategies that we're, are, we're well aware of to reduce carbon emissions. What you may be less aware of is how it's linked to public health. And that's really what the topic of this, this, uh, this uh, conversation is, is. So on one side, you see the greenhouse gases going up the stacks. On the other side, you see chronic disease. And, and really what the, what the connection is between those. I should just point out that chronic disease is what's driving our health or the health burden in California. It's things like cardiovascular disease and cancer and diabetes and things like that. That's like 93% of the health burden are those things. They're not communicable diseases. They're not measles. They're not other kinds of infectious diseases. That's the big enchilada when it comes to our health status. We could act as if these two, two issues, our climate crisis and our chronic disease crisis are totally disconnected and pursue solutions that are totally diametrically opposed to one another. That's the mules, you know, trying to get to the, their, their hay. 
and, and pulling in different directions. Or we could actually think of ways in which the strategies actually are synergistic. And that's really where the, the word co-benefits and what its meaning is really all about, is finding a win-win situation where we can both mitigate greenhouse gases and improve public health at the same time. So really, what are the, the questions become, you know, what are uh, the strategies that, that generate these co-benefits? Uh, are there any harms involved? We gotta be aware of that, you know, unintended consequences. And how do we even begin to measure the, the health code benefits of different strategies? So that's what the next piece is, is a bit of, of modeling work that is uh, called the Integrated Transport and Health Impact Model, or ITHIM. And it looks at three main ways the transportation system impacts human health. The first is through physical activity, and that's where active transportation is all about. It's the biking and the walking, and it's also linked to transit because that first and last mile has to be biked or walked anyway. It also takes into account air pollution. So we know that vehicle emissions using combustion engines generate emissions. Those are breathed in, and they cause a lot of health harm. Also, traffic injuries is the third main pathway that this model integrates into a, 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 a quantification of deaths and, and, and premature life loss. It could be dying before your optimal life expectancy or living with disability, suboptimal health. Conditions like diabetes and other kind of chronic conditions, they can persist for years and they don't contribute to optimum life compared to someone who doesn't have those conditions. So the model takes into account both mortality and morbidity. And that's actually one of its great advantages. It also quantifies the carbon emissions from, from car travel, as well as it monetizes the health benefits in terms of lives, um, of, you know, averted, deaths averted, or uh, the length of, of life, healthy life preserved. As far as what the inputs of the model are, some of these, since I know the room is filled with people who are starting their career or somewhere in the middle of their career in, in transportation or civil engineering, we use a lot of the tools of your trade as part of this model. So how many of you are aware of the California Household Travel Survey? Like almost everyone put up their hand, great. That's one of the inputs to the model. How many are, are, of you are aware of activity-based or four-step travel demand models? Your hands go up. Those are inputs to a public health output. So the tools of your trade are the inputs to this model. So that's where we're kind of joined at the hip because I use a lot of the tools that you guys use to quantify the travel behaviors, especially around active travel that are tied to physical activity, road traffic injuries, or air pollution. I should just point out that there are other ways the transportation system impacts our health. We know noise is associated with cardiovascular disease, sleep disturbances, and other things like that. So I don't want to make it sound like this model is the do-all and be-all of all models. There's many other kind of ways in which the transportation system impacts human health. Uh, when major roadways sever a community, there's all kinds of issues of access to resources that that creates and disruptions of social so there's many other things that are related to social cohesion that it would be great if we could model them in, in this model, but right now we're picking sort of the, the main direct pathways. I just want to acknowledge that there's other ways the transportation system impacts human health. Um, and, and by the way, I think we're going to have plenty of time that if you guys have questions, you can interrupt me with a question during rather than saving it to the end. So my closet question. Yep. You have traffic collisions as an input. Yep. Um, so we collect traffic 
calculation statistic, but in the for future scenarios and alternative scenarios, I'm not aware of these uh, models predict, you know, estimate the collisions. How do you get the I'll get I'll get to that. Yeah, it's it's a it's a really interesting and novel approach that has a lot of of um, a predictive power that is totally lacking in what I've seen other approaches. But I'll, I'll get to that. So how many of you are familiar with Switters data? You know what Switters are? It's a statewide integrated traffic reporting system. It is the data source. So whenever there is a collision on a public road and there's some law enforcement agency that goes out to, to investigate what happened, they file the 555 form. These forms are, are sent to the California Highway Patrol. They're, they're cleaned up, they're put in a database. And the UC Berkeley Safe Track program, how many folks know about Safe Track? Okay. They're TIMS, their uh, traffic uh, injury management system. Sarah knows what all about. Um, actually, geocodes the serious and fatal portion of those injuries, and, 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 and that is inputs to the model. I didn't talk about the other inputs, but we have health surveys, the California Health Interview Survey. We also have lots of health statistics, uh, vital statistics that the California Department of Public Health um, provides. Uh, there's census data on population growth, and actually the Department of Finance data. The whole point of this is that there's all these data sources that represent state investments that you wouldn't think they're somehow connected, but here in this model, they're all brought together. And it's also a plug for how important these data sources are for research and applied research. So uh, anytime we hear that, you know, California's not gonna do another California you know, household travel survey, I get very nervous because that is a, a real important source of data for, for calibrating the model. And it's also used for calibrating models throughout uh, the, the MPL landscape in California. All right, so let me talk a little bit about the outputs a little bit more explicitly. So for the health outcomes, we have the annual number of deaths that are, would be prevented if we went to a more active transportation scenario. Uh, there's a concept called disability adjusted life years, which if, if you die before your life, your optimal life expectancy, there's a certain number of years that are lost. So if everyone fell a little bit short and they contributed X number of, of those short years into like a common kitty, we went around the room and that happened, there would be a certain number of lost life years. The optimum would be zero. Everyone gets to their optimum life you know, span, no disease, no illness, and then boom, you're dead. <laughs> that would be in a way ideal, or you exceed the limit. But you wouldn't be penalized if you exceed the limit, but if you fall short of your optimum life, so that's what those years of life lost is. The years of living with disability also takes into account how long, you know, some conditions, let's say you, you're, Let's say you're hit by a car when you're a kid and it resulted, I don't know, let's say in an amputated limb. You're gonna go through X number of years with your lifespan with some level of disability. So again, if that were to happen in a population, the years in which that occurs are added to a common kitty. But it recognizes that some conditions are more disabling than others. So there's a waiting factor where one is you're dead. So that's the most severe disability, but anything less than that. So really severe chronic conditions like, you know, a severe kind of cancer, uh, that would have a, a high weight closer to one than to zero. You know, something like maybe a, um, I don't know, a, a, a an ear infection that, that comes and goes would have a weight close to, to zero. So anyway, the idea is that the, the duration of time that you're living with a disability is also What's important about this is not just some kind of like interesting methodological issue. It turns out that if you only count deaths, which is actually a very popular thing to do, a lot of researchers, you know, because people don't challenge deaths usually as far as not being serious, not being a serious you know, outcome. But for certain things that are really prevalent in this society, like mental illness, 
you usually don't die of mental illness, but it is a very disabling condition that if you don't take that into account, you're going to be underestimating the burden of, of, of disease in a society. So there are certain conditions in which you, you need to, to have a measure of morbidity rather than mortality to get the full picture of the impact of health outcomes. As far as the specific outcomes, remember, this is sort of the mantra, physical activity, road traffic injuries, and air pollution. Those are the three pathways. So it turns out that heart disease, uh, diabetes, uh, dementia, uh, depression, and colon and breast cancer are very much linked to physical activity. So you increase your levels of physical activity, you will, on a population basis, you will be decreasing the prevalence and incidence of these conditions. So that's how that, the, those are linked. Specific diseases that are linked to the fine particles. So this is a particular matter with an aerodynamic uh, diameter of 2.5 microns. So these are tiny, tiny little particles that are capable of when they're breathed in, they penetrate deeply into the lungs. They can cross the blood uh, barrier and get into your system and they are carcinogenic and they have all kinds of other effects. So they do produce lung cancer, but they also impact some of the same diseases that physical activity does as well. So cardiovascular disease, but also non-cancerous lung conditions like asthma and emphysema and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. It affects those things as well. And road traffic injuries, again, is those out outcomes I mentioned before. As far as monetizing the, the, the health benefits, uh, you can just count up the number of diseases, and there's a concept called the value of a statistical life. If you've heard about, anyone heard about that? A few people here. It's basically saying the value of, of one death is X million dollars. And there's different methodologies to arrive at that. But for regulatory purposes, the US EPA and other agencies, Caltrans, assigns a specific dollar amount. And it varies by agency, by agency. So right now, I think it's up to like $9.8 million per death. So if you have more physical activity, reduce air pollution, you could actually be preventing deaths, each death that you prevent, you can multiply by whatever it is, $9.8 million, and you come up with a large pool of money, that, a way of monetizing that. The other method, which is much more conservative, is says you add up all the medical bills for diagnosis and treatment, and remember those premature years of life lost? Well, they represent productivity losses, <laughs> because if you were working during those years or you had earning potential, that money that you lost for the X number of years that you died prematurely, that gets added to the kitty. So everyone who lost lives prematurely in their working ages would be contributing a certain amount of money of, of the productivity losses. So that's a different way of adding it up. But what I did is, is I sort of bracketed. Those are the two most popular methodologies for quantifying or monetizing health benefits to give people a range because each one is, has a pro and a con to it. Anyway, just so you know what it is. And then there's car carbon emissions, which is the other major output. So just again, to emphasize the importance of what we're doing here is that this is a recent tally of deaths in California. So if you wanna know what the burden of disease in California is by specific causes, here it is. Heart disease is, is this is the top 10 causes. And what I did is I, I made bold the causes that are actually modeled in ISIM. So you can see the first seven are all in the top you know, 10, and those are ones that are being modeled in part by, by ISIM. So you have heart disease, cancer, stroke, Alzheimer's disease, chronic lower respiratory disease. That, that's where you could get your asthma and uh, Unintentional injury, well, that's a big category of which motor vehicle collisions is, is a part. So it's not just, it's, you know, slips and falls and other things like, like that. And also unintentional injury would be the unintentional uh, drug overdoses would be in that category. So that, that's a really big category. But motor vehicle accidents contribute to about probably around a third of that. And then diabetes. So just to re-emphasize this model is picking diseases that, that have major impact on population health 
Newport, California. Okay, I'm now gonna shift into sort, sort of like the, the methodology. And I'm not gonna go really overboard because you know, I can show cal you know, integral calculus and all this stuff and impress everybody, but I think I'd probably lose most <laughs> people as well. But if you want a more rigorous treatment of this, come see me afterwards or read the papers because all this stuff has been, been published already. But you possibly have heard this in the popular press, this idea of, uh, it's called the attributable fraction, or it's the percentage of deaths that could be prevented only if, dot, 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 we stop smoking. I mean, we, we meaning everyone in the United States stopped smoking, or we had a healthier lifestyle through better diets or more physical activity, or we didn't uh, use firearms on each other so much. So this is now an, an estimate of, it's, it's sort of a, uh, you know, a, a yes or no. If we could just eliminate the risk factor entirely, how many deaths would we prevent? So here you see poor diet and physical activity that often go together, they're like the leading I mean that, so in other words, we could prevent 25% of all deaths in California um, if we could just have healthier lifestyles with more physical activity and better, better diets. Tobacco is always on the top of the list. And the reason why poor diet and physical activity come out on top of smoking is because I, in this particular journal article I got this from, they combine the two. But anyway, you've heard how many thousands and thousands of deaths could be prevented. So there is actually a methodology behind the percentage. And I won't go into all the details, but the point is, again, I've bolded where ISIN is modeling. So the physical inactivity, the fine particulate matter, and motor vehicles, these are among the top preventable diseases or injuries that, 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 that is driving our healthcare costs and our so now I'm going to get a little bit more into the details, but I'm not going to get a super, super technical, unless someone asks for it. <laughs> okay. So we're really talking about, in, in a sense, what are the inputs or what are the exposures? What are the, the independent variables that drive health outcomes? Okay, that I'm sure you all got. So what we're trying to do with physical activity is change the level of transportation-related physical activity through walking, bicycling, either alone or in combination with. So if, I think you're probably aware that the, 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 the minutes of physical activity engaged in transportation is probably looks like a log normal distribution. There's a lot of people who do virtually nothing or very, very little, and then there's this tail of people who are out there doing, you know, on their bicycles, doing centuries every weekend, and you know, like Dr. Zhang, or, who's bicycling every day and just getting a, you know, part of the tail, you know, in the sense of, of a lot of physical activity. So it's a log normal distribution. What we're trying to do is shift that distribution more, push it to the right, where there's more physical activity and a higher percent of the population. That's the scenario that we're trying to achieve by increasing physical activity. So again, it's a population phenomenon. It's trying to impact the entire distribution. Change in air pollution levels from shifting short car trips to active transportation. Again, that's going to change the distribution of pollutants. It's gonna interact with the entire airship. So point sources or stationary sources are still going to be there will be interacting with the transportation related ones, but ultimately changing the entire air shed, what everyone is breathing, not, not just active travelers, but people in cars who are breathing the, the exhaust from the car in front of it. And lastly, and this is getting to what Dr. Jenny was talking about, is the road traffic injuries. We're shifting distances. So I'll get into a little bit more detail here because this is a, this is a novel approach. You know, it takes two to tango, right? So that means when there is a collision, 
there is a victim vehicle, and then there is a striking vehicle. To accurately portray the risks of an injury, you need to know how far the striking vehicle goes and how far the victim vehicle goes. So you can construct an injury rate that as the denominator per mile traveled is the product of the victim vehicle and the striking vehicle. To be a little bit more technical, it is the person miles traveled of the victim and the vehicle miles traveled of the striking vehicle. So if you know what the PMT and the VMT is, and before I lose everybody, you know what I'm talking about? Yep, everyone, yes? Okay, we got a few people who aren't sure what a, a PMT and a VMT is, but they're related by occupancy. So a car with two occupants goes one mile, the VMT is one mile, but each of those people experienced one mile as well. So there's two person miles to the one vehicle mile, you make a ratio of PMT to VMT, you get occupancy. I said there were two people in the car at the beginning, okay? So again, if you're a, a, a modeler, you need to be aware of the difference between the two and it incorporates both PMT and VMT. That's really novel because when you look at most of the injury statistics that come out of the MPO models and stuff, they, they look at VMT. Sometimes they, 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 they don't even consider the two to tango piece. They, they, they put, uh, you know, parties who are really at risk to a collision in, in the middle of an of a, of a injury rate. And what I mean there is the ITHM model also stratifies by roadway type. It's a sort of a surrogate for speed and volume. So it actually stratifies the injuries. So every pairwise combination, a striking vehicle and a, a, a victim is put into a matrix and the miles that they each traveled for that particular cell in the matrix is, is further stratified by roadway type. And I mean local road, arterial, and highway. So for certain modes, like uh, bicycle and ped, you're not gonna need to, there's gonna be so little highway miles out there that they're not gonna be at risk yet. Some people create injury statistics where all the car highway miles are in the denominator and they put a ped or a bicyclist in the numerator. There's a lot of those miles they are not even at risk. So this is a, a novel approach that takes into account the miles traveled by both victim and striking vehicle. And it also takes into account safety in numbers. How many folks have heard of safety in numbers? Okay. This is just a, an empirical observation that as mode share increases, especially for active travel, the biking and walking, that injury rates to pe pe pedestrians and cyclists tend to go down in, a, in an exponential manner. Safety in numbers implies motorists see hordes of bicyclists and pedestrians out there and they anticipate you know, not banging into them by slowing down. That's one interpretation. Other people have said that's actually a case of reverse causality. It's actually all the safety improvement that allowed people to come to walk and bike in the first place. And that's really why. For the purposes of the ITHM model, I don't need to resolve that, but those miles basically have a square root function that, that represents sort of the midpoint of the, the power function of how injury rates decline with increasing mode share or increasing. So we have two questions. Let, let's do it and then we'll come back to you. Well, Neil, I'm here, Jacobson. I'm going to be for Oh, yeah. Hours. I did. And, and, and actually, I work with David Ragland of Berkeley. Yep. And, and basically, it looks like that it's prevalence. Human beings are, have real difficulty seeing rare things, but common things will see. Think of it like the baggage screener at the airport. Instead of trying to find a weapon, that's really hard to find. You know, one in a thousand weapons, the baggage he's looking at, is really hard to spot. But if they're one in 10, one in 100, they'll spot most of them. Likewise, with the radiologist looking for cancer on x ray, it's really hard to spot them if they're just one in a thousand. One in 100, they'll spot most of them. One in a thousand, you'll miss most of them. Yeah. So, 
so that, that, reverse causality. Yeah, so thank you. We have, um, again, I agree with most of that, but I also think that there is another component that could be explained by, by safe. Because, I'll send you our paper. Uh, yeah, yeah. Also, where it's true for uh, biking and walking, it's also true for other modes as well. So that's uh, maybe a weaker effect, but, it, but it's actually true for cars and, and trucks and other, other things. So if you've seen Elvix, well, we wouldn't get to argue. But anyway, the point is, is that what's nice about the model is it does take safety, into, safety and numbers into account in, in the modeling of the injury component. So all these features make the model a little bit more acceptable because it, it seems to be incorporating more realistic elements of how the transportation system Okay, let me just keep on going. So now I'm going to talk about the kinds of scenarios. So again, we're talking about shifting the distribution of physical activity, miles traveled, and air pollution. And we are contrasting these uh, distributions with a baseline. And the baseline for the travel is largely based on what's been reported in the California Household Travel Survey for walking in and biking and for certain modes like uh, bus miles and it also takes advantage of MPO outputs for uh, some of the other miles especially trucks and things like that which aren't part of the California Household Travel Survey. So we have a 2010 baseline of all those distributions and now I'll just explain what some of the state agency goals are that have been put out for different purposes. So the Air Resources Board it's part of its 2017 update of its, uh, uh, it's called the scoping plan. It's a scoping plan for, for carbon reduction for California. So it's part of the legislation that was passed in 2006, the, the Global Warming Solutions Act, AB 32. So ARB is the agency that's responsible for coordinating and implementing the state strategy on carbon mitigation. So they came up with a recommendation, a goal, which is to quadruple the amount of walking and transit and a ninefold increase in cycling compared to the 2010 baseline and achieve that by the year 2030. That's a very lofty goal that they have. They didn't say what the health implications were, but that's, you'll be seeing that shortly. Caltrans has, you might consider a, uh, a more modest, but it's also a more intermediate plan of doubling walking and transit and tripling cycling. Same 2010 baseline, but do it by 2020, uh, which is next year. So I don't think it's going to make it. Then there's the sustainable community strategy. So how many people have heard of SB 375, the sustainable community strategy? Okay, so how many people have heard of uh, regional transportation plans. A little bit more. Okay, okay. So, California, as well as many other states, have been uh, creating regional transportation plans. They charge uh, certain recognized entities called metropolitan planning organizations. How many people have heard of MPOs? Okay, good. So, the MPOs have been doing these regional transportation, you know, they're long term transportation plans. I mean, they have a 20 25 year you know, time horizon out into the future. But they're constantly updating these. Every four years, they, they have to update them with new, new projects and other, other things like that, new strategies. So um, in 2008, the SB 375 added a greenhouse gas reduction component to these regional transportation plans. It did other things as well, but that you know, for the MPOs, they had to incorporate greenhouse gas reductions in those plants. They had other requirements, you know, accommodating housing and building within their urban footprint and a, and a bunch of other stuff and air pollution, like increased air pollution. So there was a number of other requirements they had, but that was new. So I took their plans and what they said is as far as the, the, you know, the, the travel patterns and put them into the ITHM model and came up with what the health benefit would some of the individual MPOs did that on their own, but I, I, I did it for all the major MPOs in California. 
Then there's the U.S. Surgeon General recommendation. So this is our U.S. Surgeon General has been making recommendations on physical activity for decades. Turns out to optimize your health if you have 150 minutes of moderate physical activity. So that's, you know, physical activity enough to make you breathe hard. You know, if you do that, you will decrease your risk of all those <coughs> nasty chronic diseases that I put up on the, on the screen before. So that's a, a recommendation and sort of like, you know, a health optimum goal, it's a health-based goal rather than a mobility goal. Then um, the ITHM model also, which you guys could play with, I'll, I'll talk about that at the very end, but it allows what if scenarios. What if we increased active transportation by some other thing than, than a, the three, four or nine multiples, let's say you just wanted 5% and want to know what the health benefits would be, you could do that. Or you could just pick an absolute amount of physical activity. I want 15 minutes a day and see what that does. I want to do 10 minutes a day and see what that does. So the model allows you to do that. Another kind of what if scenario is, what if we could replace a lot of those short car trips, which is a, like a third of our trips are, are, are really below five miles in distance. So we could just replace half of them. I'm not talking about, you know, coming home with a refrigerator on your back from the hardware store. You know, that trip you're not gonna make on a bicycle or, or walk. But a lot of those short trips, you probably could get your shopping or whatever you're socializing done and not, uh, you know. So the idea is that you'd replace trips that are less than, you know, one mile with walking and between one to five miles that, that, that would be cycle. And then there's this a low carbon scenario, which isn't about physical activity, but it, it reflects the policy that we're going to solve our problem by electrifying the auto fleet. So there's actually no change in physical activity there. Because if we're just swapping out propulsion systems, electric for for um, you know, fossil fuel based, there's going to be no change. So that's a scenario, but it has a very dramatic effect, obviously, on carbon reduction. And then you can design your own scenario. If you know what the inputs look like, you can upload for the different modes, uh, the travel patterns, and you can quantify that as well. So just to give you a flavor for what we're talking about, and here's a spectrum of those scenarios. You can see the baseline. The top part is time, so we're talking about the median. So I said, you know, it's a log normal distribution. Uh, the mean is a little bit misleading as far as, you know, when you have a, a tail that's dragging up the mean. So I just picked the median or geometric mean to describe what the distribution looks like. But what ITHM actually does, it, 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 it takes the distribution into five quintiles and it models each one of those quintiles. So it actually is approximating the entire distribution, but for the purposes of just describing the scenario, I'm just going to um, give you the, uh, the, the median. And this is the median per person per, let's see, this is uh, per day. Okay, so the baseline, and this is a commentary on us folks, the median, amount of travel time, okay, and I broke it down by bike and walk. So the red bar is the bicycling and the blue bar is walking, but the total amount of the median minutes per day per person is on top of the bar. So in 2010, the California population spent a grand median of 2.7 minutes per person per day of walking and biking and transportation. Two minutes. I can't remember what I was doing two minutes ago, but it wasn't that long ago. We're not, we're not talking about a lot of time. So the Caltrans Strategic Management Plan, that was the one with doubling walking and transit and tripling cycling. That brings it, that basically doubles it, okay? So we're up to 5.4 minutes per person per day as the median. Short trips, whoop, we get another big boost there. We're up to 11 minutes per person per day. The Air Resources Board, and again, you can see how, the, the, how in the short trips, we're getting a lot more cycling, a lot more cycling. In the car, we're getting a lot more 
walking, even though the, the carb, the, the, the bicycle increase was a ninefold increase. But that ninefold little sliver on the baseline is what we're multiplying nine by. So when you have a very low baseline, you, when you talk about relative change, you can totally exaggerate what the absolute impact is. That's sort of another commentary about goal setting and how you approach this. Finally, the US Surgeon General is 150 minutes a week, that's 21.4 minutes a day. It's equally divided between biking and walking. And that, that was just a decision I made. You could, you could change the mix however you wanted, but just to give an equal amount. That's roughly, because a lot of people, you know, when they think about you know, time, you know, it's roughly 400 miles walk per year and about 1,000 miles cycled per year, roughly, at that level. The baseline is from the most recent travel survey yep. in California? Yep, that's the California Household Travel Survey. Okay, and now to give you a sense of distances that we're talking about. So the baseline we're talking about 0.4 tenths of a mile per person per day, which is not very much walking and biking. You get doubling of that through the Cal Caltrans program. Short trips boost that up to actually almost three miles per person per day. Uh, the, the carb scenario, um, again, because it's more walking than then in bicycling, it's intermediate, and then you get a whopping five miles per person per day with the U.S. Surgeon General. Again, we're not talking about marathons here, folks. I mean, we're talking about five miles per person per day. So that's like two and a half miles there and two and a half miles back. Just to give us, you know, what are we asking potentially people to do? We're not asking them to run marathons. It's something that should be achievable, although there's a lot of of, of work between setting a goal and actually achieving it. All right, so here's the meat. I, I, I've skipped, I've run the model, and now I'm gonna give you um, the, the, the results, the, the main results. What I've done here is to try to contextualize the, 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 the information by putting what the California burden of diseases on the left axis. So, Roughly 23,000 deaths per year in California are attributable to the lack of physical activity. Roughly 9,000 are due to particulate matter. And I should just point out it's from not just the transportation system. This is from all sources. So the same thing with physical activity. That's all, it's leisure time, that's occupational, it's home, it's transportation. So it's just whatever the source of, of, of physical inactivity is, that that's what the, the overall burden is. And then road traffic injuries is roughly 3,000 uh, per, per year. Just to give you a sense of what the order of magnitude is, that it's this chronic disease piece, um, or the physical activity piece. Um, a lot of that 9,000 in the, the air pollution is also chronic disease as well. What you see on the right side of the graph are the different scenarios that I laid out. Those are the, the state agency ones, the Surgeon General, short trips. So you get a sense of this. And, and I did it as a stacked bar so you can immediately get a sense of what is contributing to the reduction in mortality. Because that, what, what this is, is that anything above the zero point, which is this line down here, so you have minus, that actually means you're adding to the burden. You're making, you're making more deaths. Anything above that is you're actually preventing deaths. So immediately you can just <coughs> stop, you know, look back and say, hey, wait a minute. Some of these scenarios are actually increasing the road traffic injuries. Whoa. I don't know if the state agencies actually talk that through or Obviously, they contracted with me to do this work, so they, they know now. But the point is that I don't think that was widely appreciated when some of these scenarios were, 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 were put out there. And there's some really interesting nuances, even in the ones that have a little bit of red on the top, meaning that they prevented those deaths. There's some really interesting subtle things that I'll get to because there's some issues of mode equities where 
that it heads, cyclists, and cars are actually experiencing the benefits in a very different way. So let's just go through here. Uh, it's hard to see, but there's a little thin blue line here that reflects the air pollution benefit. So just again, let's just step back and look at the big picture. I mean, you can hardly see it. I mean, it's there, but the big benefits are really about physical activity, not air pollution. Yet, it is air pollution that tends to drive our conversation about electrifying the auto fleet and benefits there. We seem to be ignoring the big enchilada, which is chronic disease reduction through physical activity increases. And that's where the health code benefits reside in active transport, not so much. I mean, every bit counts. So air pollution, yeah, is really important to reduce that. But it is not the major source of health benefits. And as you see here, road traffic injuries, depending on the scenario, could increase or decrease. Michael has a question. So Neil, for the short trips, you basically have half the short trips in a walking or bicycle, right? Right. So in that scenario, the VMD will be reduced yep. and, uh, and then the active transport mode will increase. And that, since the red is the road traffic injury, so that means in that scenario, the road traffic injury risk gets higher. Yep. Uh, but your, um, your risk uh, factor was the VMT and the PMT. Um, so in that case, you, the- we'll, we'll get to this, because this is something that the model predicts, which is not intuitive, um, because you have all the different modes interact. So one of the biggest uh, uh, um, threats to car occupants these other cars, that's where all the crashes, I mean, a lot of the cars are <laughs> crashing between each other. So you get a big VMT reduction of cars, you're actually reducing the car-to-car -car collision rate substantially. And that's where the benefit is for, for scenarios that have a large substitution. One thing I should just point out, again, it gets into some of the methodological issues, is that each one of these scenarios has the same level of mobility over all modes. So it's roughly 10,000 miles per person per year over all modes. So I've kept, to simplify things, so there's actually no more or less overall travel. I haven't restricted any, any overall mobility. All of these scenarios have the same total mobility over all modes. So that it really is, when you increase active travel, you're decreasing car. You're increasing transit, you take that away from car. So depending on the extent of substitution, so the more ambitious scenarios are obviously taking more of the car miles traveled. So for the injury com component, remember, you have two things in the denominator. You'll have an increase in the PMT, so that's the victim, you have more walking and biking, but then you'll have a decrease in car travel. So you're gonna have this tension between the two and the denominator. And depending on which one overcomes the other, the overall injury rate will, will change. And that's in part, that's a technical explanation why you're seeing in some cases, you're seeing increases in other cases, decreases. So that means the, the road traffic injury will involve more pedestrians and bicyclists, right? Because the, the other side is reducing and then you have a total number of increasing. I will show a slide that will get into the details of that for one of the scenarios. Because again, it's not totally um, intuitive. And because the safety in numbers, we're, we're actually taking the square root of this, it, it has a, a differential impact. So, and I actually, this is one of the really more powerful things about IFM because Again, I've, I've read a lot of the MPO plans, and this is totally missed by all of them. And I think, you know, again, when you see, you know, the National Highway, uh, Federal Highway Administration just came out with the most recent, you know, statistics. What do they show? Decrease in car to car injuries, increases in PED, and exactly what is being predicted here by, you know, having more active transportation, because we know that is occurring. There is more biking and walking. So that exposure part, more miles traveled is, is happening in that denominator, but we're also seeing something going on with that, that, that other part that's contributing, which is the car miles. 
it's not clear to me that it's actually VMT reduction there. It may just be the safety of the vehicles is, is, is greater. We just, um, I'm wondering, rate and risk are yep. not the same. Yeah, I'm going to get to a slide that will just illustrate that in a very, it will, it will be really interesting and, and, and somewhat counterintuitive, but when you do the math, it actually makes sense. Okay, so that was the health outcome. So I just want to go back again and, and say, you know, the U.S. Surgeon General, that's the 150 minutes per week. When you look at the green over here and compare it to the green over there, obviously we would be making a big dent in chronic disease reduction if we could implement the scenario with that level of ambition. And this is where the MPOs are, this tiny little piece of green over here. Yeah, I mean, every bit counts, but more ambition gets more health benefit. So really, they're at the sort of the lowest level of ambition. Um, and there are other scenarios that if they were achieved, would, would, would generate far more health benefit. And I'll get to the carbon reduction in a second. I mean, the other message is that, that really, you're seeing that air pollution, while it makes a contribution, it's very modest compared to the other sources. And since the air pollution discussion tends to sort of dominate in our our discussions around transportation and climate change, I just wanted to point out how, from a policy standpoint, getting more active transportation is going to have a lot of, of benefit. Here are some of the other outputs of, of the model. Again, you have your blend of scenarios in rank order. So you have, and this is, again, the two different methods for quantifying the health benefits. One, the cost of illness is counting up all the medical bills and the lost productivity. The other is assigning a, in this case, I, I use an old EPA figure, only $7.4 million, whatever, whether it's 7.4 or 9.8, you generate huge annual savings. So those several hundred deaths that were averted, you know, turn out to be for the uh, value of statistical life, $67 billion in monetized health benefit per year. So again, that's not trivial. That's actually a lot of money, um, which is what plowed back into the transportation system. You know, the problem is, you know, the health benefits are accrued by a different group of people than the people have to put out the capital expenditures to increase. So this is called the wrong pocket syndrome, where the people who have to shell out the money, meaning the transportation agencies, are not the ones reaping the, the benefit. On a societal level, this is occurring, but on a more transactional basis. So how, from a policy standpoint, can you somehow plow these benefits back into the system is a, is a real challenge from a policy standpoint. The next slide is carbon reduction, because that, is, that was my basic premise, is that that we should be thinking about active transportation as a strategy for carbon mitigation. So let's take a look at how much carbon are we actually reducing? So you can see, again, I did it in rank order, but I just wanna point out the low carbon driving. And again, that's basically, it was, it's based on work that was done here by Nick Lutze. I don't know if people remember Nick. Okay, I mean, he was, I don't know where he is now, but he was a graduate student, published a paper several years ago in which he, basically looked at a market share of hybrids, electric vehicles, uh, biofuels, all kinds of, uh, of strategies that, that were likely to occur in the, you know, from 2010 to 2045. And he generated a family of curves of, of carbon reductions based on you know, how ambitious adoption of electric vehicles, and lightening up the weights and everything else that, that can be done from an engineering standpoint to make uh, uh, lower carbon emissions. So I, I just use his maximum <coughs> figure. Basically, he predicted by 2045, if you used all those strategies, you could reduce the uh, carbon emissions by roughly a third from the 2000 baseline. So I'm, that's what I'm using for the projections here. So yeah, you get big reductions. So the, the baseline is roughly 
90 and again uh, from um, from car and again I'm only focused on car travel not the other modes because again the substitution that we're doing is between car and bike and walk yeah there's going to be some transit stuff but I didn't take that into account so there's roughly 95 million metric tons per year in 2010 uh, from uh, the, the, the car emissions in California you can see that there's modest reductions from that 95 million metric tons. And this is where the CARB scenario comes in. So it's roughly about a 20 million metric tons per year reduction, which isn't so bad. It's making a contribution. Maybe not as much as the low carbon driving. These things aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. You could consider both the active transportation plus the low carbon driving cumulatively as a way to reach our goals rather than putting all of our, our, our eggs in, into the uh, low carbon driving basket. Now, I want to get back to the injury piece because this is really important. And I'm only comparing one scenario with the baseline. This is the uh, the, the Air Resources Board, this is where we quadruple walking in transit and ninefold increase in bicycling. So what I've done here is I put the absolute number, which is sort of what you're getting at when you talk about risk, but also a rate. <coughs> and this rate is per mile traveled of the victim. So we're talking about pedestrian injuries in the numerator, we're talking about miles traveled in the denominator as a pedestrian. So I've taken that rate and, and, and broken it up a little bit and just, just looking at it from the victim standpoint. So when you look at the baseline, which is in the darker bars, or in the, the blue bars are the scenario for walking, the absolute numbers actually go up for walking and cycling. The absolute numbers for cars goes down. And that reflects largely the car to car. Collisions are going down because you're reducing their miles traveled. When you look at it from the standpoint of a rate of, so this now is looking at mile, the numerator is the injuries, the denominator is the miles traveled of that mode. You actually see big reductions in injury risk per, per 10 million miles traveled for both walking and cycling, there is a decrease for cars, but you, could, you hardly see it because the amount of car travel is so overwhelming that even when you take out a little bit for walking and biking, it doesn't change it that, that much. So here you have a really interesting, almost counterintuitive situation where it's getting safer in, in this scenario per mile travel but the absolute numbers go up. And it won't be until there's really big reductions in car travel that, and, and substitution with active transportation or uh, transit that you see uh, the numbers go down as well. That's what places like you know, Netherlands have already achieved. And they're not, they're not um, contrary to one another, but when you increase the exposure to biking and walking dramatically, it, it, unless you have inordinate amount of attention <coughs> to safety, you will be generating these kinds of, of results. And this is exactly what we're saying right now. Okay, so I wanna, we have a question, go ahead. Uh, yeah, it's one of the, uh, account for traffic injury rates in different geographies, uh, or is it like a constant number for the entire California and you're charging a number? Okay, this, the, the model, I'll answer your question in a couple of ways. One, ge micro geography in this, only in the sense that we stratify the injuries by roadway type. So we have local roads, arterials, and highways. So that matrix, if you can imagine a matrix with every mode crossed with every other mode, 
and all the two-way combinations in which they can collide, where if one axis is the striking vehicle, the other is the victim. So you have to imagine that matrix, matrix has been repeated three times. One for local roads, one for arterials, and one for highways. So that is like a microgeography, and, and it accounts for, you know, it's a surrogate for volume and speed, because we know what the consequences are, you know, pretty much what the, what the likelihood of a fatality when you um, are, are traveling at a particular speed. So that's one way geography is accounted for. The other is the model is calibrated by region. So the tr specific travel patterns that are specific to a region. So that gets into the California Household Travel Survey and having adequate sample size so that the regions are the nine Bay Area counties that conform to the MPO region. So I've done it partly because I want to make sure that the MPOs have something that they can use. So it follows their business practice. So we have the nine Bay Area counties, which is part of MTC, that's the Bay Area M MPO. We have San Joaquin Valley, which is largely based on uh, the Fresno COG, but it's been expanded to the population of the eight San Joaquin Central Valley counties. Then we have Sandag, which is the San Diego County, it's its own MPO. And then Skag region, which is the uh, it, eight counties uh, in Southern California. And then the Sacramento COG, um, which has what I think six or eight counties as, as well. So those are the regions. It does do some downscaling, geographic downscaling to the 30 counties that are part of those regions, those MPO regions. And it uses the regional health benefit but, it, but it, it, it scales it to the population size and the age and gender structure of a specific county. So, you know, it's not ideal, but it's useful. So that's how geography, so really the, the most refined geography that this will work at is at a county level, if you want to accept. So, it, you know, you have to use your judgment in the sense that if it's a county that is the dominant population center in the whole region, then it's like double counting. I mean, it's probably more valid there. But if it's only 10% of the overall region, you just have to ask yourself, is, is there something about this county, its transportation system, something else that's so different than the region that would make people question the validity of making that assumption? But it's a question I get all, all the time. So I'm going to, to summarize, I mean, we've been working on the ITHIM model in conjunction with the ITS, uh, Kellen Rodier helped me calibrate the model with some graduate students uh, almost 10 years ago already. So it's something that we've been working on for, for quite some time. And here are some of the use cases and publications. So obviously, California transportation agencies, they're falling along a spectrum of, of health co-benefits from active travel. Um, again, physical activity is the primary driver of those health benefits. You get, you know, depending on the scenario, you can have either very little or very large monetization of that. And it's not, you know, money to sneeze at. Uh, the SESs are the most modest. I mean, let's face it, folks. I mean, they're, they're not going to be moving the needle very much if they keep doing what they're doing now. There would need to be a huge ramping up of those sustainable community strategies to achieve health co-benefits as well as the DMT reductions. And there's been activity in, this, in the state legislature to try to change that. I don't think it successfully, I think they held the bill this year, it might be reintroduced to, to put more emphasis on solving that issue. Um, while the net health benefit can be positive, we have to, dig deeper into the safety because this issue of mode equity, I mean, we might be decreasing the overall, I mean, creating an overall health benefit because an overall reduction in collisions, but it's not looking at the heterogeneity of modes. There could be a big overwhelming benefit from car to car collision <coughs> reduction, which is not mutually exclusive from 
or not, uh, doesn't contradict the possibility of there being increases in head and bicycle fatalities. So that's really important. And it's also a, a, a note to the MPOs that the way they're going about modeling this right now is probably not adequate because every MPO EIR that I read did not acknowledge that this was a possibility. And that I think needs to be looked at more carefully. Um, again, we're looking at different strategies for greenhouse gas mitigation. Uh, you know, physical activity is one pathway, air pollution is another, that we need to think about all the policy options, including doing things that will increase physical activity and transportation and not just focus on um, electrifying uh, vehicles, because that will, yeah, that will generate some benefits, but you saw that air pollution slice in there, it's tiny compared to physical activity. It will just represent a huge opportunity lost to, again, do the right thing and make the population healthier and reduce greenhouse gases. Um, the other thing that, from our publications, is that um, strategies that, that, that optimize bicycle travel are really good for health, but they're also the best strategies for reducing carbon. And that's just because they cover more territory. They're more competitive with cars as far as the distances that they can cover. So yeah, we want a balanced portfolio, but we need to think about how the specific role of cycling is in carbon reduction. It has both the health benefit, but it also has a bigger impact on carbon reduction. And as it's been pointed out um, in the climate world, uh, pedal now or paddle later. So uh, having a strategy that, that emphasizes cycling, I think is really important. But I wanted to also give you a sense of it's not, not just research that, that lives on a shelf and journal articles, it's actually had an impact already in California. So this one aspect of this work, which I call policy education, the findings of the model for probably close to 10 years now have been brought to the legislature and brought to legislative hearings to educate policymakers about the, the role that, that active travel plays in our transportation and greenhouse gas uh, dilemma. Advocacy groups have just latched onto this, whether it's you know, the bicycle advocacy or the walk, walking groups and the, the climate groups, uh, some of the environmental justice groups, of all latched onto this because it, it really helps advocate their, their position. So it's been very useful to shift the dialogue. You know, this is not Denmark, this is not some abstract place, this is California. And I think that helps change the nature of the conversation. We've also done stuff, actually not with my work here, but my job at the Public Health Institute, we actually created policy briefs down to the level of a legislative um, district for both the Senate and, and for the assemblies where we create a little item profile of what, what could be gained through active transportation, so things like that. The other use cases, I mean, it's really been used by MPOs and, and state agencies to quantify health benefits so that they can advocate internally because a lot of these state agencies, you know, they're, they're not monoliths, you know, you have, Big agencies that feel like, oh, we got to enter, engineer our way out of this, and others say, no, we need to think about land use. We need to think about that. So, it provides information so that within these agencies, they can have more informed discussions about what the benefits are of different strategies. So, I think that's that's been very helpful. And obviously, the California Department of Public Health, as a advocate for public health, has you know been a champion for leading the charge on educating other state agencies on the health benefits of active travel. Um, they have a climate health equity program, which I was part of years ago, but it's continuing. And they're trying to sort of do that inside, you know, there's the inside outside paradigm of trying to promote change. So they're doing it from the inside using the, the scientific evidence for this. Um, as I mentioned, MPOs have actually used the model. So four of the, M of the five big MPOs have actually used the model to quantify the health benefits. Um, 
they've just been nagged to death by their uh, advocacy groups where they live to say, do more to increase the health content of your transportation plant. And we want to see you do something. So they came running to me because they felt, you know, under attack politically that they need to respond. And there just aren't that many models out there that does, that does this. And, and so by default, I guess I'm, I'm the one who, uh, who you know, helped them. But the idea is that they're, they're trying to respond. And I've worked with the MPO staff. And, you know, the MPO staff is different than their governance bodies. And many of the MPO staff are very, very much committed to trying to increase active transportation, but they're operating in a political environment that makes it very difficult for them to implement all of their most ambitious plans. <clears throat> MTC is probably unique among the MPOs. So when they run their travel demand models, they run it system-wide and they quantify the health benefit of their large projects. Uh, I'll get to you in a second. So right now, for the last, last cycle, any project that was capitalized at $150 million or more, that project was run through their activity-based model to quantify all kinds of things, you know, travel time, congestion, you know, the usual stuff. But they also want to know what the health benefit was. So they used Python sort of as a post-processor to come up with that. And they monetized it. And it actually shifted priorities. I mean, they ranked, you know, it was like 150, well, more than that. Initially, it was like 750 projects. So only the, the top ones floated to the surface, the big ones. So the large, usually it's tra you know, transit, regional transportation projects. They became like to the top of the list because when you monetize the health benefits, they were, they were overwhelming compared to the other benefits that were also monetized. So it's a sort of an interesting approach that they've now integrated the Ithin model into their business process where they're trying to justify the prioritization of projects using health as one of the criteria. So I think that's a huge success, you know? They don't advertise it broadly, but you know, when you think about impacts you have, to me that's like, wow, that's a big success because it's, it's, it's now, you know, what do they say? When the, ordinary, when the extraordinary becomes the ordinary, that's when you know you've gotten success. So this was a very novel thing a decade ago, but MTC and Fre like Fresno Cog, I mean, they're doing it too. So it doesn't have to be just big, well-resourced MPOs. Other ones are, are doing it as well. So you know, it's more of a political will. The other kinds of, well, let me just go through the room. The other uh, benefits, um, so I'm not the only one out here doing this. Uh, I've coached other people. So the LA County Health Department, which is a little bit unique among health departments. It's almost like a state within a state. Um, I trained them on the model, they ran it, and they uh, analyzed their, uh, their, their metro, the LA City Metro's uh, plan. They have a transportation plan, the 2030 mobility plan. So they applied the ITHM model. So it can be used at a county level for you know, different purposes. Uh, the health impacts of autonomous vehicles. So that's something I gave the reference here, but that's something that, that our own UC Davis investigators are, are doing besides me. So that's uh, Miguel uh, Hilaire and uh, um, uh, Carolyn Royer, myself, and a graduate student, Elam. There you are. It's the first time I'm actually seeing you or meeting you. Anyway. Yeah, I, I was going to ask, like I was going to, talk with you after the meeting. Okay. Anyway, I just want to acknowledge that you know, uh, we have, there's other kinds of use cases and very elegantly we applied that to uh, using the actually MTC travel uh, uh, activity-based model output. That's an input to ITHM with several scenarios. And the findings are really interesting. And it's right now a paper that will be presented at the annual meeting at TRB. So anyway, we're doing other kinds of, 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 of use cases. I uh, wanted to just show oops, that, again, we're not alone. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of, this is the implementations of ITHM. Um, you can see it's heavy on the West Coast. You can see the different regions. But Oregon has been running this every year for the last, I don't know, seven or eight years. It's part of their routine. The health department and the, their DOT just runs the model on an annual basis to see how well they're doing. 
So they've routinized it there. There's been implementations in Nashville, Tennessee. There's an in interest in Atlanta, uh, uh, Maryland. I helped implement there with the folks from the National Center for Smart Growth. I don't know if you have connections with Garrett Knapp or any of the folks there. But anyway, um, the team there has implemented it as well as um, in Delaware, there's been an implementation. Massachusetts has calibrated the model. They haven't gotten money to run scenarios yet. I just helped Vermont, so a tiny little state like Vermont, you know, so there's like no excuse for other states that have a lot more resources. So there's a number of implementations. There's also academic centers. So UC Davis has a big flag there for being one of the, the academic centers, University of Wisconsin. Madison is also an academic center. Alex Corner, who is a former graduate student here, is at, now at the University of Texas. He helped implement ITHIM for the Sacramento region a couple of years ago. So there's a, a loose network in the United States of folks who are working on this, as well as an international collaboration at the University of Cambridge. And it was really James Woodcock's group that got the whole thing moving in 2009, and he's seated groups around the world uh, to do this. So I've helped people in New Zealand, Australia, and I've calls from all, all over the place you know, for, for help. Um, um, why don't we take your question? Oh, okay. I have a question about some of the interactions between the air pollution and the active transportation. Sure. I've seen in some recent EIRs where they were looking to not let the speed of the motor vehicles drop below 25 miles an hour to keep the uh, emissions down. And for a project being built now, I'm wondering how valid that is given that there's a change in the progression of the change in the vehicle mix over the life of the project. Is that? I'm not sure I understand the question. Are you saying that, that lower speeds are increasing pollution? Yeah, they were saying they yeah. didn't want the motor vehicle speeds below 25 miles an hour because wow. they emit more, there's more emission if they go hmm. slower. Boy, I've heard a lot of things, but I haven't heard that one yet. Um, I don't know how to respond to that. I mean, I, I mean, you could quantify the, the difference. If, I, mean, I mean, if you wanted to know the two competing issues uh, because I mean above 25 miles an hour definitely increases the mortality risk but then they're saying I mean it's, it's it sounds I haven't heard that I mean it sounds pretty counterintuitive and most people are talking about reducing speeds and reducing the injury risks there is a concern that's and I'll just acknowledge it that Oh, Neil, aren't you endangering people, you know, the bicyclists and pedestrians by having them bike and walk near busy roadways? And because their respiration rates, you're walking and you're biking, you're breathing heavier, your actual intake of pollutants is higher. Aren't you negating the benefits of physical activity? And the answer is yes, if you're a pedicab driver in New Delhi. And you're doing this six hours a day in an atmosphere that's probably 150 micrograms per cubic meter of, of PM 2.5 or greater. But in the kinds of exposures that we experience in California, which is largely below 50 micrograms per cubic meter, which is you know, even considered a hot spot, you would never have enough minutes per day to have an inhaled dose that would negate the effects the, 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 of, of of being out there and being physically active. So there's two things going on. What's going on with the active travelers, but also there's basin-wide reductions in the emissions by having that, that substitution. That, I've heard that argument. But this issue of speed is not, uh, but you could quant theoretically quantify what that is because they're increasing the risk of, of injuries, but potentially they're arguing that they're decreasing the risk of air pollution. I don't know. I, I, I would have to see what that really looked like to, to I believe I also wonder if the project that's built now that will likely last, I don't know, 50 or how many years. I, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It's, an, it's an interesting argument. I just haven't heard it before. Yeah. I just wanted to add to that argument that like, I've heard the same that stopping more traffic is often increases 
be ambition when it comes to the vehicle, like especially for ice. Like it doesn't come much from vehicle, and like if they're stopping in, like if they're driving. Can you speak louder? Can you speak louder? Yeah, I've heard that argument as well. That if vehicles are stopping and moving, and they're moving at really low speed, then the emissions, especially yeah. for particulate matter, is much higher. Then they're moving at a constant speed, which is somewhat higher. Yeah. Like, yeah, just adding to that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not denying that that's not the case, but again, um, if, it, if it's a question in isolation, because what the, the ITHA model is doing is integrating the road traffic injuries, the air pollution, and the physical activity. So if there's a question about active travelers and stop and go traffic, I mean, there's other things too. I mean, it makes the assumption that the active travelers are, are right there rather than having a, a route choice that could be just a block away that drastically reduces their exposure. It also is compared to what? So you take that bicyclist and put them in the car behind, they're getting that you know, high levels of exposure. Maybe the respiration rates aren't as high, but they're getting high doses. So there's a whole bunch of literature that's just come out looking at air pollution you know, and what the relative contribution is of exposure to, uh, to other modes. And we need to consider all of those things before we categorically say one thing is better than, than the other. Because, you know, what's going on inside the cabin of a, of a car could actually be more, more deleterious than that uh, pedestrian who's just walking a block away from busy traffic. If there is no block away because it's a, you know, really constricted access, then there's an issue there. But, you know, there's a bicycle boulevard that's, that's parallel. I mean, these are design things that we can mitigate the exposures. We have some other questions uh, too? I, I think uh, the time is up. So we, um, you know, we'll stop here, but uh, Neil will be here for, you know, about at least a half, half, an hour. Yeah, half an hour. And if you have a burning question, you can talk to him afterwards. Um, okay, let's thank you for that this model is accessible to you guys. I haven't made a big, you know, big splash. It's really up to the Air Resources Board to make a big splash, but the URL is available. So if you want to go and play with the model, there's the run item page. It's very interactive. There's a ton of decision support material on there. It recycles a lot of Susan Handy's work. <laughs> so uh, UC Davis is very much uh, important in the decision support material, uh, especially on VMT reduction. So I invite you to go ahead and play with it and see what revelations you, you come up with. Okay, gang, thanks.